with you. Dan has a brief opening statement, then we'll be happy to take your questions. Please give us your name and affiliation. Dan. I want to say I've been uh, down at the Cape for many launches before as a contractor with a payload in the bay of the shuttle, and this is the first time I was down here as a NASA administrator with the full force of America's team behind us. And uh, the beans never tasted so good when I went over <laughs> to the line to eat them. Uh, it was sweet. I think tonight we saw the very best of America. We took uh, uh, a rebuild on the uh, shuttle. Our contracting team brought it in under budget. They delivered it on time. And it's in perfect working order. And I think that's a real testam testament to the ability of the American aerospace industry. And then the crew down at the Cape did an absolutely superb job. I just sat and watched. I didn't touch any buttons, as I promised. And uh, it was just amazing to watch the efficiency of this crew of people. We have a real dedicated team, and I'm just damn proud of America's team. And with that, you want to take questions? With that, I'm ready with that, for questions. With that, we take questions. questions. Gentlemen, right here in the front. You. Ah. Right here. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is Shri Shati with the Orlando Sentinel. Uh, Mr. Golden, as beautiful as the launch was and, and how important Endeavor was and so on, it, you're being reimbursed $93 million for a flight that costs half a billion. Um, is this going to continue in the future or is this a one-shot deal? I, I didn't understand the question. Could you repeat it again? It, it, this flight, the reimbursement is about $93 million for basically a commercial customer that will reap a billion dollars. Um, is this sort of an accidental thing, or is this like a pattern that will continue in the future? I don't believe this is a pattern that's going to be in the future. I'd like to say that uh, this is a very, very important mission. There are a number of critical EVAs that are coming up. We have three days of EVAs with uh, two crews, two, two crew members on each EVA. And if you look forward to Hubble Space Telescope, that's going to be a very, very challenging EVA mission. And I look at this as a stepping stone towards that. And if in the process of working uh, these activities, we could help ourselves learn and at the same time help out a, a satellite that's in trouble, we ought to do it. But I don't think the purpose of this mission is to do a discounted price to someone that's going to make money on the satellite. Right there. This is Phil Chen, Earth News. Mr. Golden, a month ago when we met, you said you didn't want to take any instant reactions on the third day of the job. But uh, now you've uh, practically lived in the airplane for the last month, going around, visiting all the NASA centers, talking to people. We heard some of your comments a couple of days ago. What do you see as the future of NASA? Are you going to get more big programs, more of the smaller, faster programs, or what? I'm still going to hold off telling you something. I gave you my observations on the TV uh, that I made at the different centers. I found an energetic, motivated NASA team. I also found a team that understood some of the problems within NASA, and we are going to work on a process where we have a shared vision from NASA. We're still on plan to do that, and when we have that shared vision, I hope to have as many of the 25,000 NASA employees sign that vision, because one human being isn't going to determine the destiny of NASA. That's macho leadership. 25,000 people that have a shared vision, that know where they want to go, that then share that vision with the American people is where the power is going to come from. So I'm sticking right to my plan, and we're on target to go do something. Right here. Right here, right. Irene Brown with Florida Today. I was just wondering where you stand on uh, selecting a deputy. That process is getting worked right now. Uh, we have uh, identified a number of people. We're in the process of talking to them. I do not select a deputy. The president selects a deputy. It is a presidential appointment. What we can do is make suggestions to the president, but the deputy serves at the discretion of the president. Right over here. Stephen Young with Spaceflight Magazine. Endeavor's your newest orbiter, but it's probably your last, uh, if we can believe what the president has uh, directed. Um, do you feel there's any need for another orbiter, and do you feel you can operate the shuttles through to 2020, which is your goal? I did not say 2020 is my goal. I said the uh, shuttle is right now America's only human access to space. We're going to use the shuttle as long as we need to, and when there's an appropriate replacement for the shuttle, we'll consider it. There's no date in my mind. It could be 10 years, it could be 20 years. I don't have any commitment to 2020. Uh, 
Now, I'm sorry I lost the track of the rest of the question. Could you please come back? Do you, do you still feel, or, or does NASA, under your, new, under your leadership, feel that a, a sixth orbiter is necessary to maintain space station operations? We have not yet gotten into the details of that, but it is my assessment that the present fleet of four orbiters will be more than adequate given we have no uh, significant problems in the future. There are many things that we have to do in NASA, and building infrastructure is not high on the list. Accomplishing missions that return benefits to humanity in America is what we are intending to do. Gentlemen, right here. Uh, Todd Halverson, Florida Today. You talked a little bit about the importance of the uh, EVAs on this mission. I'm wondering if you can uh, maybe talk about how this mission gives us a glimpse into the future of space operations. Well, uh, we're going to learn quite a bit with the assembly operations that are going to go on. There are some simulated uh, space station assembly operations. We're going to have very, very long duration EVA activity. Two crews, three days, again, learning about human interaction in space is what this is all about. So those are the type of things we're going to learn. I'd like to go in the back. There was a gentleman back there who had his hand up. Yeah. Uh, the space station uh, for the future of America and for the Endeavour, uh, so uh, how long will it be used for the Endeavour in this uh, future mission for the space station? We anticipate that uh, for the initial operation and probably the midlife operation of the uh, space station, we'll be using the shuttle. But we do not preclude other possibilities as we look into the future. Robert Stewart with the Los Angeles Times. Mr. Golden, uh, your deputies and others have, have noted uh, accurately that one of the themes uh, of this mission is going to be things that uh, men and women can do in space that uh, uh, machines and robots cannot. Uh, is this mission coming at this critical time in the uh, uh, Washington appropriations process going to give you any help uh, at all, do you think, uh, as far as uh, your fight to keep funds for space station freedom? Let me say, I, it wasn't planned this way. <laughs> uh, good news is always nice, but I believe the NASA budget has to be sold on its merit. There has to be understanding of where we're going and what we're trying to do. It's nice that we had a good mission here, but that's not what NASA's about. We hope we can explain to the public the basic reasons we want to do it, and that's to understand the interactions of humans in the hostile space environment, to understand really how they will operate, what their dexterity is going to be, um, what happens under the stress of zero gravity, how do you perform industrial and commercialization operations in space? That's what it's all about. And uh, it's nice that this happened, but I would hope that that would not be the reason that people would vote for the space station. We've got to sell our programs based upon the merit and not the theatrics. We have a gentleman over here. Jim Banky, Florida Today. Mr. Golden, uh, can you tell me how you were personally involved in the decision to delay the launch to a daylight launch? I know it's kind of water under the bridge now that it's off the ground, but but weren't you personally involved with that? Let me uh, tell you uh, the process that took place. We had a flight readiness review, and after the flight readiness review, I had a one and a half hour review with Dan Brandenstein and his team. We also had a telephone conference with the uh, managers down at NASA Johnson at the Cape in the headquarters. And during the process, uh, it was indicated that there were a few people that were concerned about a nighttime launch. And the thing that I found to be so rewarding and so exciting is there was no uh, uh, negative connotation about the minority opinion. It was openly expressed, and during the course of the conversation, I had asked the team that was responsible for deciding on the launch date to relook at it. And I said, I will live with whatever decision you make, because I said I'd empowered you and I trusted you. They went back through the process, they thought through it, they listened to the minority opinion, and they said, I think that the right thing to do is to slip it three days, it's prudent, Three days is not going to change the course of the world, and safety is the first job. And after they made the decision, I congratulated them on working the process properly. Right there. Uh, Bert Rudman, ABC News. 
I noticed, Mr. Golden, the applause from the gallery upon uh, liftoff was a little bit louder today than, than usual. Give us your perspective, sir, uh, perhaps uh, from you or the mood of NASA now that um, this particular orbiter has brought uh, full circle from the Challenger accident, NASA's shuttle program. I think uh, we have a new start, and that's how I felt. When I saw the flames shoot out of the bottom of the Endeavor, I said, a new fresh page is starting. And I can't be into everybody's mind, but I think there's a certain relief and excitement that we now have done it, and it's a new, fresh slate. Beth Dickey with Reuters. I, I realize that NASA has um, set the price for the Intelsat Reboost mission based on its policies that were in effect in 1990, but I'd like to know, if you had been the boss then, and it had been your decision to make, would you have charged Intelsat more for the job? Golly, I, I, I don't know how to answer that question. And in fact, uh, I wasn't even aware, to be quite honest, of the $93 million charge, and I, I'm appreciative of hearing of it. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, I, I'd like not to speculate on previous decisions because uh, the people made the decisions, and we have to trust the people that made the decisions and move forward. No other questions? We can wrap this up. Thank you.